Hey everyone, it's John here, and in this video we're going to take a look at the top 30 advanced Excel tips and tricks. So these are the things that you need to know in order to go from beginner to an advanced user. As always, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel for future Excel videos like this one. Now let's get started. The first tip we're going to take a look at is combining data from different files in different folders. So if you've ever had to combine data from different files, it can be quite a pain. And what you might end up doing is opening each file and copying it and pasting the data into another Excel workbook. But Excel can do this for us and it's actually quite easy. So let's take a look at an example here. We've got a couple folders and in each of those folders, we have files. So we have a file for each month of sales data. Let's just take a quick peek at one of these. So here's our sales data. And what we want to do is get the data from each of those files. Let's close this. And to do that, we can go up to the data tab and in the get and transform data section, we can go to get data and from file. And there's an option to get data from a folder. Now here we just need to supply the folder path of our data. And so I've got that copied into my clipboard. I'm just gonna paste that in here. And this folder path here, this is the top level folder. So this is the sales data folder. And then within that, we have each of our folders for the data for each year. And we can press okay. And here we'll get a preview of all those files. So this isn't the data quite yet. It's just a list of all the files that we have in our folders. And what we want to do is come down here and use the combine options. And we're going to select combine and transform data. And that's going to open up this combine files menu. And now Excel is going to base how it combines these files on a sample file. And you can choose which file to use. So we're just going to use the first file, which is the default option here, but you could select any of those files and since they're in the same format it won't really matter and here we've got a list of all the sheets in that file so if we click on our one and only sheet here that's going to generate a preview of the data in that sheet and we can press ok And that's going to open up the Power Query editor and it's going to show us a preview of our combined data here. And if we're happy with the way that looks, then we can go up to the Home tab and close and load this into the Excel workbook. Or if we want, we can further transform this data to suit our needs using some of the commands in the other ribbons. So we have a transform and add column ribbon here. And these ribbons have various commands to transform our data. Now in this example, our data, we just want to combine it. So we're going to go back to the home tab and close and load this to our Excel workbook. And then we have a couple options of how we want to view this data. So we're going to load it into an Excel table, but we could also load it directly into a pivot table or a pivot chart or if we were using Power Query to perform other queries on that data, then we could use a connection only and not load it into the workbook. But we're gonna stick with the table and let's add it into our sheet here and press okay. And then Excel has loaded our data and let's just format our order date here. So let's format it as a date. And let's check out what we have here. So you can see that we've got our order uh, data or sales data from 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. We've gotten and combined the data from all those four folders and have loaded it into a single Excel sheet. Now, the amazing thing about this is that it's dynamic. So if we go back to our folder here, and if I go up one level, I've actually got data for 2014 in this folder here. And I'm just going to move that into my sales data folder and 
and go back to Excel. And if I right click and refresh this query, then Excel is also going to load that 2014 data. So I can come up to my order data and check that it's there. And there we go. So we now have 2014 data as well. So that's how you can easily combine data from multiple files in multiple folders using Power Query. The next tip we're gonna take a look at is using text to columns. So sometimes when you copy and paste data into Excel, it ends up in a single column and what you really want is to have it in multiple columns. So I've got some data here and it's in a single column, but we've got multiple items in our data. So we have a first name, and a last name and a company and an email address all separated by a comma. And what we really want is to have each of those in its own separate column. So we can do that pretty quickly with text to column. If we select our data and go up to the data tab, we can use text to columns and that's gonna open up the text to columns menu. And here we have the option to separate out our columns based on a delimiter or based on a character count. In our case, our data is separated by a comma, so we're gonna use the delimited option. And we can press next. And now we have to choose our delimiter. So we're gonna remove the default tab option and choose a comma. Notice when we select comma, we get these lines separating out our data in the data preview. So we can check and make sure that's done what we want it to. And we can select next. And here we have some various format options available. And we can also choose where we want to put our results. So let's put it over here. And let's hit finish. And now we have each of those items in a separate column. So that's how you can quickly separate your data into multiple columns with text to columns. The next tip we're going to take a look at is removing duplicate values. So we've got a small set of data here and we can see that some of the values are duplicate values. So we've got a 1995 Jeep Grand Cherokee and we've got the same data down here again. We can easily remove our duplicate values by selecting our data and going up to the data tab and using the remove duplicates command. And that's going to open up our remove duplicates menu. And our data has column headers, so we're going to leave this option checked. And we want to base our duplicate detection on all three columns of our data. So we're going to leave all three columns here checked as well. And we can press OK. And Excel is going to tell us that we had three duplicate values that were found and removed. And we have eight unique values remaining. And we can press OK. And you can see that those duplicate values have been removed from our data. So that's how you can easily remove duplicate values in your data. The next tip we're gonna take a look at is using autofill and fill handle. The active cell in a worksheet has a fill handle. And if you hover your mouse cursor over the lower right hand corner of the active cell, the cursor is gonna turn into a small plus sign and that's how you can use the fill handle. So we can use this to do things like copy and paste formulas. So this cell here has a formula in it. And if I click and drag that down, then it's gonna copy and paste my formula down. We can also use this to create simple sequences. So here I've got a sequence. So I've got one and two. And if I click and drag that down, it's going to complete the sequence for me. Here our sequence is going to increment by two. And we can do the same thing with dates. So here we've got a date and if we click and drag that down, then it's going to create a sequence of days for us. Here we've got a sequence of months defined. We can click and drag that down and it's going to fill out the sequence of months for us. And we've also got the same thing with years and we can do the same thing there. So here we get a sequence of increasing years and we can also use autofill to create 
month names and weekday names. So here I've got January. And if I click and drag that down, then it's going to fill in the rest of the months for me. We have the same thing with the shorthand month. And here I've got Monday listed. And I can fill in all the rest of the days and the shorthand weekday name. We can do the same thing. So that's autofill and the fill handle feature. It's an easy way to copy and paste formulas or create sequences of data automatically. The next tip we're going to take a look at is using flash fill. So flash fill is going to allow us to combine, extract and transform data based on examples that you provide. So let's take a look at using this. Here we've got a list of email addresses. And if we want to extract the first and last name and the company name from this, then we can use flash fill to do that pretty easily. So we just need to provide a couple examples. And as we start to type out our second example, you can see that flash fill has caught the pattern and is suggesting that we just want the first name in that email address and we can press enter and that's going to fill in the rest of the data for us. Let's get the last name. And we can also access this from the ribbon. So if we select the data examples and the area we want to fill in, then we can go up to the data tab and use flash fill from there. And that's going to fill in the rest of the data for us based on our provided examples. Let's get the company name here. And we also have a keyboard shortcut for this. So if we press control E, then that's also going to fill in the rest of the data for us. So here we were extracting and transforming the data. So we also capitalized those notice. We can also combine data. So for example, maybe we want to create an email address based on some given names. So again, we can just provide the first couple examples. And flash fill will guess the pattern and fill in the rest of the data for us when we press enter. So that's how we can use flash fill to combine, extract and transform our data based on a couple given examples. The next tip we're going to take a look at is using a custom list. So if you find yourself continually entering the same data over and over again in your spreadsheets, then you can use a custom list to alleviate this manual data entry. So for example, here we've got a list of products and maybe this is a list of products that the company I work at sells. And I'm going to be using this list over and over again in my work. So we can create a custom list with this data. And to do that, we can go up to the file tab and go to options and go to advanced options. And if we scroll down to the bottom here in the general section, there is an option to edit custom lists. And here we can manually type in our list items and then add our custom list. But we also have the option to import a list from Excel. So we're going to do that. And we can select our products here and click on import. And that's going to import those list items. And we can see our custom list here has been added. So let's press OK and press OK again. And now whenever we want to use this list of products in our worksheet, we can simply type out one of the products. So let's type out caps, for example, and we can use the fill handle and drag that down and it's going to fill in the rest of that list for us. So that's how we can use custom lists to avoid manual data entry. The next tip we're going to take a look at is freezing the window pane. So if you've got a section of your spreadsheet that you want to keep in view whenever you scroll around in your worksheet, then you can do that with the freeze panes feature. So for example, here we've got a set of data and if we scroll down, then we can no longer see the column headers. And if we scroll over to the right, 
then we can no longer see our sales order number. And if we want to keep those in view at all times, what we can do is select the cell below and to the right of those columns and rows. And if we go up to the view tab and freeze panes and freeze panes again, then that's going to freeze those parts of the spreadsheet. And now if I scroll down, notice the first row there remains visible. And if I scroll over to the right, that first column also remains visible. Now, if you want to remove this, you just need to go back up to the view tab and freeze panes and you can unfreeze the panes. So that's how you can keep parts of your spreadsheet in view at all times using the freeze panes option. If you want to view multiple sheets in a workbook at the same time, you can do that by creating a new Excel window. So here I've got a report for 2017 and in another sheet, I've got a similar report for 2018. And we can view these at the same time. If we go up to the view tab, we can create a new window. And now if we go back to the view tab, we can arrange these windows. So we get some options here to arrange them. Let's check out vertical and press OK. And that arranges our two windows vertically together. And now we can set one of them to our 2017 report. And that way we can view them side by side. Now, notice when I scroll in my 2017 report, my 2018 report doesn't scroll, but we can set these to scroll synchronously if we want to. So let's go back and enlarge this and go back to our view tab. And in there, there's an option to view side by side if we click on that. Now, if we scroll in 2017 report, our 2018 report will also scroll synchronously. And if you want to turn that off, you can go back to the view tab and turn off synchronous scrolling. And now just our 2017 report scrolls. So that's how you can view multiple sheets in the same workbook. At the same time, you can create new windows and arrange them. In this tip, we're going to take a look at Excel tables. So Excel tables are containers for your data in Excel. And they work really well with tools inside Excel, like pivot tables and Power Query. And they also work well with tools outside of Excel. So for example, if you want to use your Excel data in Microsoft Power Apps or Microsoft Flow, then you're going to need to have your data inside an Excel table. So we can add our data to an Excel table by going up to the Insert tab and using the Table command here and Excel is going to guess the data that you want to add into your table based on where your active cell cursor was. So you just want to make sure that Excel has guessed the correct range here. The first row of data in our data here has column headers. So we're going to leave this option checked. My table has column headers. And when we press OK, then our data is added into an Excel table. Now I'm just going to undo that. We also have a keyboard shortcut to do the exact same thing. So control T will open up our create table menu and we can create a table that way. Now, the first thing you want to do when you create a table is give your table a new name. So if you go up to the design tab, then you can replace the generic default name here. And you want to give your table a short, sensible name. So I've got housing sales data here. So I'm going to call my table house sales. And if I press enter, that renames my table. Now tables have a lot of awesome features. In fact, too many to mention here, but we'll just take a quick look at a couple examples. So for one thing, you can give your tables quick styles. Up in the design tab, there's a lot of options here to restyle your table. We also have table style options here, so we can turn off banded rows if we wanted to, or turn on banded columns. We also have a total row option, and that's going to allow us to add in formulas in the last row to sum up our columns, or count them, or find the max, or min, etc. I'm just going to turn that off. 
Another thing is that tables will absorb data. So if you start typing something just below your table, then that's going to be absorbed into your table. And the same thing with columns. Another handy feature is if you're adding in formulas into your table, then that's automatically going to fill down your table. So here I just entered a formula in the first row and it's copied that formula down for me automatically. Let's go to the bottom of our table. Another nice feature is that formatting will automatically propagate throughout your column. So here I've got the sale price and it's formatted as a currency. And when I enter new data, you can see that the formatting gets applied as a currency and I don't have to format my new rows of data. We also get table references when we create formulas that reference a table. So if I sum up this column here, then you can see that my formula references my house sales table and the sale price column in that table. And that makes reading formulas a lot easier. So those are just a few of the benefits of tables. If you have data, make sure you put it in an Excel table. If you have a set of data and you don't know where to begin with analyzing that data, then you can use Excel's ideas feature. So ideas is a new AI feature in Excel that's going to help you summarize and find trends and other patterns in your data. Now it works best with data inside an Excel table with column headers. And we can use ideas by selecting our table and going up to the home tab. And the ideas button is here. And this is going to generate various pivot tables, pivot charts, and charts from your data that Excel thinks you might find interesting. So you can scroll through those and you can also show all the results if you want. So for example, here Excel has found that the overall quality field and sales price field appear to be highly correlated. And if you want to use this chart, you can click on insert the chart. And that's going to create the same chart for you in your workbook. So if you need help with your data analysis, check out the new AI powered ideas feature in Excel. If you want to get more out of your data, you can use Excel's new rich data type feature. So here we've got a list of companies and we can convert those to stock data types by going up to the data tab and using the stocks data type. And that's going to convert them into rich data that contains multiple pieces of data about that company. And then you can extract the data using this extract to grid button. So for example, let's get the headquarters for each of those companies, or let's get the current stock price. Now what this is actually doing is creating a formula that references our rich data type. And that cell now has various properties and we can use this dot notation to extract that property. So for example, here we're referencing amazon.com and we're using the price property to get the price from that cell. Now with the stock data type, we can also do currency pairs and currency conversions. So let's go back up to the data tab and convert those into stock data types. And now we can get the current exchange rate for those. We also have a geography data type, so we can convert geography type data into rich data types. And here Excel had some problems identifying what we actually want. So we can go over to our data selector pane and select the country of Ireland. And now with those, we can get various information like the capital city or the land area, etc. So get more out of your data with rich data types.
The next tip we're going to take a look at is using fuzzy matching. So you might be trying to compare two lists of data and it's the same data, but the values in them are not quite exactly the same. So here we've got two product lists and you can see, for example, we have men's watches here. That's probably the same thing as watches in this list. We also have women's watches. Again, probably the same thing as watches. With this kind of data, you wouldn't be able to use something like VLOOKUP or INDEX MATCH to match these up because those would only work if you were dealing with exact matches. But we can use fuzzy matching in Power Query. So first, let's load these two tables into Power Query. So let's go up to the Data tab and create a From Table Range query. And we're just going to load these as a connection only. So let's just create a connection to that table. And we'll do the same thing with this. And let's load that as a connection only. And now that we've got those two tables loaded into Power Query, we can come back up to the Data tab and get data and we can combine those queries with a merge. So that's going to open up our merge menu here and we can select our product list one and we're going to merge that with our product list two. And we're going to do the merging based on our only field here. So we just select those two fields and we can choose what kind of join type here. We're just going to get all the data from our first list and matching data from our second list. And if we just did that, we wouldn't get any matches because we don't have exact matches in our data. So what we're going to need to use is fuzzy matching to perform the merge. So we can enable that and we can take a look at some of the fuzzy merge options. So there's a threshold and this is going to be a value from zero to one. So zero, we're going to return everything as a match and one, we're only going to return exact matches. And by default, this is just set to 0.8. We can also set how many matches we return. So if there's more than one match, we could set something to only show one match. The default value here is a really large number. So we're just going to leave that blank. We also have the option to supply a transformation table. So if we know certain things are going to be abbreviated in our other list. So for example, maybe we want to match Microsoft with MSFT, then we can set up a table that has those mappings in it beforehand and use that in our fuzzy matching. We're not going to use anything here. And before we apply this, we can see that from our selection of matches, we have six out of seven rows from the first table have been matched. We could come back to our threshold and play around with that and see if we can improve that. So here, a threshold of 0.6, we get seven out of seven rows were matched. Let's try that. And here we have a new column attached to our first table. So a product list two column, and this contains all the matches. So we just need to expand this out and let's not have a prefix and we can press okay. And we get our matches there. And now let's load this into the workbook. So let's load it as a table and let's put it in our sheet here. And we can take a look at the results. So here, fuzzy dice, it's been matched with blue fuzzy dice, air freshener matched with pine air freshener, men's gloves. Here we got it matched with gloves, etc. So if you're trying to compare two sets of similar data, fuzzy matching can really help out if your data isn't quite an exact match. The next tip we're going to take a look at is creating a dropdown list in Excel. So if we select the cell where we want our dropdown list, we can go up to the data tab and use data validation. And for the validation criteria, we're going to select a list. And then for the source of that list, we're going to select this range here of 
car makes. And we can press OK. And you can see that we now have a drop down list. So if we click on that, then we have our available options from our range here. And we can select our value. Now, if we want our drop down to be a bit more dynamic, so that if we add something into this range, then it's going to appear in our drop down list without needing to update our data validation range. Then what we can do is turn this list into a table. So if we select our data and go up to the insert tab and use the table command there. And let's just give our table a name. And let's go back to our drop down list and back to the data tab for the data validation of that cell. Now, instead of directly referencing that range, what we're going to do is use the indirect function to reference that range based on the table name. So in double quotes, we're going to write our table name and then in square brackets, the column in that table that we're going to use as our data validation source and close off the double quotes and close the function there. And we can press OK now. And we still have the same values in our drop down list. But now, if we add a value into that table, then it's going to appear in our drop down list. So that's how we can create a drop down list in Excel using data validation. In this tip, we're going to take a look at how we can display a message whenever a user selects a particular cell. So to do that, we can select the cell we want to display our message in and go up to the data tab and data validation. And in our data validation menu, there's a tab up here, input message. So by default, it should be checked where it says show input message when cell is selected. We want to leave that checked and we can put in a title for our message. And we can also input the message. And press OK. And now whenever we select this cell, it's going to display our message. And we can also move this around. So if we click and drag it and release, then we can change the location where that message is going to pop up. And I'm just going to press the arrow key and the message will go away. And the arrow key back to that cell, it's going to pop up again. So that's how we can display a message whenever someone selects a particular cell. In this tip, we're going to take a look at creating a named constant. So in Excel, we can name any cell or range of cells. So for example, we could name this cell here by going up to the name box and giving it a name and pressing enter. And now we'll be able to refer to that cell by the name. So if we create a formula, then that new name is even going to appear in the IntelliSense. And we can reference that in any of our formulas. But it's also possible to do this without using a cell. So we can create a named constant that we can use in our formulas, but won't appear anywhere in a cell that could accidentally be edited to some other value unintentionally. So to do that, we can go up to the formulas tab and we can define a name and we can give it a name. And here it refers to right now, it's referring to this cell right here in our workbook. What we're actually going to do is delete that and input the value we want for a constant and press OK. And now we see that named constant in IntelliSense as well. We can select that 
and use it in our formulas. And there's no risk of that value being accidentally changed. So that's how you can create a named constant in Excel. In this tip, we're going to take a look at the if function. So the if function is going to allow you to do conditional type of calculations. So for example, here we have a list of sales data and maybe the company is doing a promotion and they're offering a 10% discount on any sales over $300. We could use the if function to calculate this discount based on our total here. So let's do that. And the first argument in the if function is the logical test you want to perform. So in our case, we want to test whether the total here is greater than or equal to 300. And if it is greater than or equal to 300, what we want to do is take the total and multiply it by 10%. So that's the amount of our discount. And if it's false, if that total is less than $300, then we don't have a discount and we're going to return zero. And when we press enter, you can see that for some of these rows here, we have a zero. So that's where our total is under 300. And the rows where we have a total over 300, we get our 10% discount amount. So that's the if function that you can use for conditional calculations. The next tip we're going to take a look at is using the COUNTIFS function. So this is going to allow you to count the number of items based on one or more criteria. So for example, in our sales data here, we can count the number of sales for yellow products with an extra large size using the COUNTIFS function. So let's try that out. So the first argument in COUNTIFS is the first criteria range that you want to test. So for us, that's the color column here. And we want to see if that's equal to the color yellow. And we also want to test the size column here. And we want to see if that's equal to extra large. And we can press enter. And what we get is a count of two. And if we look in our data and scan down for yellow and extra large, we see one and two here, and that's it. The next tip we're going to take a look at is using the SUMIFS function. So similar to the COUNTIFS function, this is going to allow us to sum data based on multiple criteria. So for example, in our sales data here, we can add up all the values where we have a black product and a large size. So let's try that out. So the first argument is the range of values that we want to add up. So that's going to be from our total column here. And the next argument is the criteria range that we want to test. So we want to test and see if our color column here is equal to black. And we also want to test our size column here and see if that's equal to large. And when we press enter, we get our total value here, 997. And if we look in our data, we can see that we have this value, this value, this one and this one. So we have four black products that are large. And when we add up the corresponding values here, we get 997. The next tip we're going to take a look at is using the VLOOKUP function. So VLOOKUP allows us to find and return data from another table. So for example, here we have a category ID in our sales data. And then in another table, we have the category ID and the corresponding category name, we can use VLOOKUP to return our category name into our sales data here. Let's do that. So the first argument in a VLOOKUP function is the thing you're trying to find. So for us, that's going to be the category ID in our sales data. And then we're going to try and find that in our category table here. And the next argument is the column index. So the thing we want to return is the category name, and that's in the second column. So we need a two there. 
and we can do an approximate match or an exact match. We want an exact match, so let's choose that. And when we press enter, you can see that we now have our category name in our sales data. The next tip we're gonna take a look at is using a combination of index and match functions. So similar to what the VLOOKUP function does, we can use the index and match functions to find and return data in another table. So the match function allows us to find a match in an array and then return its position. And the index function allows us to return a value based on a position. So we can combine the two to get the value that we need. So first off, let's take a look at the match function. So the first argument is the value we're trying to find, and that's our category ID. And the next argument is the array you're trying to find it in. So for us, that's our category ID column in the category table. And the last argument is the match type. So again, we want an exact match. And when we press enter, what we get is some numbers here. And these numbers correspond to the position of the match in our category column here. So for example, here we have a three, and that's because we're trying to find category ID three in our category ID column here. And that's the third item in our list. Now with this position value here, what we can do is return the value here in this column based on the position. And we can use the index function to do that. So let's add an index function in here. And the first argument of the index function is the array that we want to return our value from. So for us, we want to return our category name. And the next argument is the row number to return. So for example, if we had a four, then we would be returning mountain bikes because that's the fourth item in our category name column. And in fact, the position value is going to come from our match function here that we already calculated. So that's going to be the row value that we return from our category name. And the column number that we're gonna return values from is gonna be one. And that's because we've only got the one column, our category name column here. So let's close that function off. And you can see that we now have our category name in our sales data. So for example, category ID six here, we have caps, and that's exactly what we have in our table here. So that's how we can use index and match to find and return data from another table. In this tip, we're gonna take a look at Excel's new dynamic array functions. So with these dynamic array functions, we now have the ability to return multiple values from a single function. So previously we were confined to returning one result from one function and that's no longer the case. So there are six new functions, filter, rand array, sequence, sort, sort by, and unique. And these are definitely some functions that you wanna start using. So for example, let's take a look at the filter function. So that's gonna allow us to filter an array of values. So we can filter a table here, for example, and then we can filter it based on some criteria. So let's filter it on the color and let's filter it when that's equal to black. And when we press enter, you can see what happens is even though we just entered one single formula in one cell, we get an array of values returned. So we get all the data from our table there where the color is black. Let's take a look at the sort function next. So that's gonna allow us to sort some data. Let's sort our table of orders here again. And let's sort it on the fourth column, so our quantity column. And we'll sort it in ascending order. And when we press enter, you can see that we get the same data returned, but in our quantity column, you can see that we have an ascending order now. So from a single cell 
formula, we're able to spill multiple values into our worksheet. And now to do this, to spill all these values, we need to have blank values here. So for example, if something's in the way, if there's a value here, then what's gonna happen is our function is gonna return this spill error because there's a value in the way where this function wants to spill its values. So if we delete that, we get our spilled results back. Let's try out the unique function. So here we can get a list of unique values from our data. Let's check out the unique values in the color field. And here we wanna compare each row And let's press enter and check that out. So here we got our list of unique colors from our data set. We also have a sort by function. And that's gonna allow us to sort our data based on more than one column. So let's try sorting our data based on the color column. And let's sort that in ascending order. And then let's sort after that based on the quantity. And we'll sort in descending order for that. And let's try that out. Here you can see our color column has been sorted. And then in the quantity, that appears in descending order for each color. So here we're going from 12 to one for all our black items. And here we're going from five down to two for all our multicolored items, etc. The other functions that we have is a sequence function. And that's just going to allow us to create a sequence of values. So we could create a sequence of values in a range of six rows and maybe five columns. And we can start at one and maybe increment by two. And then we get a range with increasing values, starting at one, increasing by two each time. And we have five columns here and six rows. We have a similar function called randarray, and this allows us to create a random range of values. So let's try returning seven rows of values and three columns. And let's return values from one to 100. And we can decide to return decimal values or just integers. Let's return integer values. And here we get an array of random variables. And each time we enter that formula, those values are gonna recalculate. So those are the six new dynamic array functions. Now with these new dynamic array functions comes a whole new calculation engine under the hood. So it's not just these dynamic arrays that can spill. Older functions have now gained this ability to spill data. So for example, let's try out an if function. And let's test and see if our color column here is equal to black. And if it is, let's return a one, and otherwise let's return zero. And when we press enter, we get that spilling as well. And you can see wherever we had black, we have a one. And wherever we don't have the color black, we have a zero value. So those are the new dynamic array functions and the new calculation engine behind the scenes that allow older functions to spill results as well definitely a new feature that you want to start exploring. The next tip we're going to take a look at is showing all your formulas in the worksheet. So normally the only way to tell if a cell contains a function is to click on that cell and see that there is something in the formula bar. But if you want, you can switch to a formula view mode. So up in the formula tab, you can show formulas and that's going to switch the view to show your formulas instead of the resulting value. And when you click on 
any of those formulas, then you're going to be able to see the dependent values. So here we can see that this formula references our category ID and the table over here. Now we can turn that back off by clicking on the show formula button again. And this also has a handy keyboard shortcut. So control tilde is going to do the exact same thing. And we can use that again to toggle it back off. In this tip, we're going to take a look at filters. So we can add filters to any list to explore the values in that list. So you can add filters to any list by selecting the data and going up to the data tab and using the filter command here. And that's going to add these sort and filter toggles to our data. And in here we can sort our data. And we can also filter it. So this is a text field. We have some text filter options here. So we can filter things that begin with a certain text or ends with a certain text, etc. Let's try filtering on things that contain bikes. And let's press OK. And then the data that we get is just for those values that contain the word bikes. And what this has actually done is just hidden the other rows of data in our list. Now we can filter on multiple columns. So for example, we could also filter on black here. And now we're just showing products that contain the word bikes and are the color black. Now we can clear out any filter by using the sort and filter toggle and just clear out the individual filter for colors. Or we can go back up to our data tab and clear out all the filters here. Now one handy feature is if you select a value in your list and you want to filter on that value, you can right click on the value and go to filter. And we have various filtering options here and we can filter by the selected cells value. So if we select that, now we're just filtered on the color yellow. And let's just turn off filters for a second here. And it turns out that actually works. If you don't have filters applied to your list, you can still use the filter by selected cell value. And that's going to apply filters and apply our filter for our selected value. Let's clear that filter out. We also have the ability to manually select our filtering. So we have a list of all the items in our field and we can manually select which ones we want to filter on. And that's just going to show those values here. Now there's a handy keyboard shortcut that you can use along with your filters and that's to just select the visible cells from a filtering. So if you select the range of data and use the keyboard shortcut alt semicolon that's going to allow you to just select the visible cells from your filter. So that's Excel filters. They're great for quickly exploring certain values in your data. In this tip, we're going to take a look at advanced filters. So these are going to allow us to filter our data based on more complex filtering logic. And to use our advanced filters, we need to first set up a criteria range. So we're going to have the three columns in our data here. And then underneath, we're going to have our filtering logic. So if we want to filter our data on Subaru cars, we can add Subaru here. And let's select our data and go up to the data tab and use advanced filters. And we have the option to filter the list in place or copy the results to another location. And we're just going to filter the list in place in this example. So we have our data selected here and now we need to add our filter criteria. So we're, it's going to be this selection here. And if we press OK, then that's going to filter that to just our Subaru cars, as you can see. Now let's clear that filter and let's try filtering on Subaru and Impreza model. So we can add Impreza here. And let's go back to our advanced filter and press OK. And now we're just filtered on Subaru and Impreza. Let's clear out that filter. Now, if we want to filter on a certain make or a certain model, then what we can do is offset those. So let's try filtering on Subarus or A5s. So let's just delete this. And down here, what we're going to do is enter A5 five, which is an Audi. 
and let's go to our advanced filter and we're gonna to need to modify that range. So it includes our A5. And now if we press okay, you can see that we've got Subarus here and we've also got all our A5 cars. Now let's further filter these results so that we only get Subarus or A5s where the year is 2009 or less. So we can do that by adding in our year column criteria here. So let's add the criteria less than or equal to 2009. And we're gonna copy and paste that to this criteria as well. So now we're gonna be filtering Subarus that are less than 2009 or A5s that are less than 2009. So let's just clear out our current filter and go back to advanced filters and adjust our criteria range here. And let's press okay. And here we have Subarus and the year is 2009 or less. And we have only two A5s this time. And that's because some of them have a year that's greater than or equal to 2009. So these two rows that we have in our filtered results are 2009. So they're less than or equal to 2009 and show up in our filtered results. So that's advanced filters. It allows us to create more complex filter logic. So if you have your data inside an Excel table, then you can add a slicer to that data. So a slicer is just a user-friendly visual way of filtering your data set. So to add a slicer, you can select a cell inside your table and go up to the table design tab. And there's an option here to insert slicers. When you select that, you have the ability to choose a slicer for any or all of your fields. Let's add a slicer for our product and color field in our data and press OK. And we get these two slicer objects here. So one for the product and one for the color field. And you can see in each of those, we've got buttons for each of the items in those fields. And that's going to allow us to filter our data. So we can select, for example, just chains and our table gets filtered down to just chains. We can also click and drag to select multiple items. And we can use our two slicers to add multiple filters. So here we're selected on five of the items and let's just select the yellow items in there. And we can clear our slicer filters from here. And we can also turn on a multi-select mode here on our slicers. And that's going to allow us to select and unselect multiple non-adjacent items in our slicer. So slicers are a great way to add an interactive element to your table data. In this tip, we're going to take a look at pivot tables. So pivot tables are a really easy way to analyze and summarize your data. So we can create a pivot table for any set of data that we have by selecting a cell inside our data and going up to the insert tab and selecting the pivot table command. And then Excel is going to ask us to select the table or range of data that we want in our pivot table. And because my data is in a table, Excel's selected that table name here for me. And we also need to select the location for our new pivot table. So we're going to add it into this existing worksheet here. And we can press OK. And that's going to create a new blank pivot table for us. Now, when you select a pivot table, it's going to open up this pivot table fields window. And this is the command center for building out your pivot tables. If you don't happen to see that, you can right click in your pivot table. And there'll be an option to show the field list. So right now we see hide field list. And that's going to hide that field list. We can right click and show the field list. And in this field list, we have all the fields from our table listed out here. And we have four areas here that we can put those fields into. So we have a values area here, and that's where you place fields that you want to summarize. So for example, in our data, maybe we want to summarize our monthly salaries. So we can click and drag that field into the values area. And you see what happens is we summarize our monthly salary by summing it up. So this is the total monthly salary in all our data. 
and then we can add other fields into the rows or columns area and that's going to allow us to see a summary of our monthly salaries by those fields. So for example, if we wanted to take a look at the monthly salary by gender, we could add that into the rows area. And in our pivot table here, we have the total monthly salaries for females and males. We can click and drag that field into the columns area and we get a similar thing, but across the column here, we have male and female and our total monthly salaries. And maybe we want to look at job role. So we can drag that into our rows area. And now our pivot table shows the job role by gender. So we can see that manufacturing directors that are female have a total monthly salary of 533,000. So pivot tables are really good at slicing and dicing your data and allowing you to analyze it in many different ways. So right now our monthly salary is being summed, but we can also change that if we click on the monthly salary field here and open the value field settings. Then you can select various different summary types so we can count average, max, min, or take the product as well as standard deviations and variances. So let's check out the average. And now for example, male human resource employees make an average of 4,100 per month. We also have this filters area. And if we add a field into there, for example, maybe let's add the age, then that's gonna add this filter to our pivot table. And we can use that to filter our data down to maybe just those who are 20 to 25 years old. And now our data is just showing summaries for age 20 to 25. So that's pivot tables. Great for quickly summarizing and analyzing your data. In this tip, we're going to take a look at slicers and timelines for pivot tables. So we previously saw slicers for tables. So we also have slicers for pivot tables. So if we select our pivot table and go up to the pivot table analyze tab, we can insert a slicer there. So let's create a slicer for gender and press OK. And that's going to filter our data in our pivot table. And right now I've got gender in my pivot table. We don't actually need the field that our slicer is based on in our pivot table, and we're still going to be able to filter our data based on that field. We also have a timeline object. So if you go back to the Analyze tab, we can insert a timeline. Now this is just like a slicer, but it's specifically for date fields. So here I'm only gonna have my date fields listed. Let's insert that slicer. And here we have our time periods listed horizontally. So we can select different time periods this way. And that's going to filter our data based on those dates. Right now we're selecting on months. We have the option here to select different time periods so we can filter years or quarters or days as well. So timelines are just like slicers, but specifically for date fields. In this tip, we're gonna take a look at the show values as calculations for pivot tables. So these allow you to view your pivot table results with different calculations applied. And we can apply that to any field in our values area. So we can right click on the field and go to show values as. Right now, no calculation is applied, but we have several different options here. Let's take a look at percent of grand total. And you can see that that changes our pivot table results to a percentage. And it's a percentage of the grand total value. So for any item in our pivot table here, laboratory technicians, the value we get here is the sum of the monthly salary divided by the total monthly salary in our data. 
So let's just take a look at that calculation. Let's add monthly salary into our values area again. And let's just scroll over here. And if we take this sum of monthly salary for our laboratory technicians and divide it by the grand total, you can see that what we get is our 8.77% that's displayed here. So that's the show values as feature. It's a great way to view your results with different calculations applied. In this tip, we're going to take a look at the data model and building relationships between tables in our data model. And that's going to allow us to analyze and summarize data in one table based on the values in another table. So here we've got a set of order data and we've got a category ID in that table. And here we've got a set of categories and that also has a category ID here, and then the corresponding category name. And what we can do is build a relationship between the category ID in this table and the category ID in this table. And that way we can summarize our order data based on the category name. So we can do that by creating a pivot table with our order data. Let's go up to the insert tab and use the pivot table command. So that's selected our orders data. And we're going to put the pivot table in this worksheet here. And the important part is to add this data to the data model. So let's check that off and press OK. And we get our new blank pivot table here. Now we're also going to create a pivot table for our category table. Let's go back up to the insert tab and pivot tables again and it's selected our categories table here. Let's put that right next to this table. And again, we're gonna add this data to the data model and press okay. And now whatever pivot table you select, you can actually see both tables in the pivot table fields list. So if we select all, then we can see both those tables so we don't actually need this second pivot table here. We can delete that. So we just need to add our data into the data model when we were creating the pivot table. And now we can just use this one pivot table here. First, we have to build our relationship between these two tables with their category IDs. And we can do that by going to the Analyze tab. And there's a command here for relationships and we're going to build a new relationship between those tables. So we're going to relate our orders data with the category ID to the categories table, also based on the category ID, and we can press OK. And here's our new relationship built. Let's close this menu. Now in our pivot table, we can add fields from both these tables. So let's summarize our total value in the values area. And we can actually summarize that total now by our category name. So we can drag our category from our categories table. And here we're summarizing our total orders by the category name. So this is a field in our one table here. And this is a field in our orders table, but we're able to use both those fields in the one pivot table. Another very powerful feature that we get with the data model is the DAX formula language. So this allows us to create extremely powerful and flexible calculations in our pivot tables that we can't normally do with a regular pivot table. So we can add one of these calculations or measures as they're called by going to our pivot table fields window. And if we right click on any of the tables, we can add a measure. And then we can give our measure a name. And we can write our formula here in the formula editor. So for example, one of the things you can't do with a regular pivot table is get a distinct count of items, but we can do that pretty easily with our DAX formulas. 
So there's a distinct count formula. And let's maybe count the category ID in our orders table. And close off that formula. And let's press OK. And in our pivot table fields list, we have this new item here. And you can see it's a measure. We have this little FX symbol before our name. And we can click and drag that into our pivot table just like any other field. So let's add that into the values area. And you can see we have eight distinct items. So if you find that you can't quite get the calculation you need from a regular pivot table, then you're likely going to be able to do that with DAX formulas and the data model. Want more awesome Excel tips? Then sign up for my Excel newsletter. So the link for this is in the description below. And when you sign up for the newsletter, I'll send you a free copy of my Excel tips ebook. If you enjoyed this video, then you can help me out by hitting the thumbs up button and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so. That's it for this video. See you in the next one.